You should care about independent watchmaking because at the end of the day, that's where it all starts, right? Doesn't matter if you're the world's largest conglomerate, at some point, those watch brands were independent. They go from being these small micro independents to large companies over time. Twenty nineteen independents that I have my eye on are going to be uh, Acrivia is the number one brand that sticks out to me. Um, very small, twenty five watches a year. Watchmakers with Jeff uh, who has this incredible background. He makes some of the nicest watches I've ever seen, regardless of brand. The biggest difference now is people are. I think more open and willing to look at independents where they haven't maybe always been. One, it could be price point. Two, it could be access. Um, 2019, I think you're gonna see more people start to look at independents as a alternative to some of the brands that we would normally see, your Vacherons, your Breguets, some of the some of the higher end brands that are in the in the big conglomerates. I think these are really gonna manifest themselves through really sort of smart marketing strategies by the by the independents themselves. And also the quality of the watches, like at the end of the day, that's what's gonna make a difference. Other brands that I think are, are gonna be up and coming, or at least should should get more recognition, I think Laurent Ferrier is gonna be another brand. This year they had a great SIHH. They had some really nice uh, new additions to their existing collection, which I think is important. And then they did release uh, a new uh, model, which is a tank-shaped uh, piece, uh, which, to me is going to be an interesting fit because he's used to doing round cases uh, and I loved what he did last year. So adding this new tank shape piece, that's gonna be something that I'm interested to see where that goes. Uh, another brand I think you always gotta keep your eye on is Richard Mill. So there's, there's differences between being an independent brand and being a micro independent brand. And it literally is the amount of units, right? Audemars Piguet, Paddock, Rolex, those are all independents. So they're not micro brands, obviously. Uh, I would say Richard Mill is still, still fairly micro, but they don't make that many watches a year. So you're still talking about a brand that's making a small amount of units because quite frankly, they, they really don't need to make a ton of units. I mean, they have a limited edition piece, their McLaren RM11 that is a million dollars a piece and they're doing 70 of them. They don't need to do a lot and they sell out which is to me unbelievable. I mean, it really is. Uh, so they're still doing small quantity watches. If you're talking about genuine micro independence, like Acrivia at 25 units a year, that's a genuine independent. Kerry Vutalainen makes 30 watches or something along those lines a year. Uh, Thomas Pressure makes a handful of watches. You've got uh, R.W. Smith who makes three or four, whatever the, the amount. I mean, it's such a small amount. Maybe it's a, a dozen watches, but it's so small. Those are still the micro independence and they still do you know your level of personalization uh really cool super limited quantity pieces while still making enough watches to put in stores and to open boutiques and things like that so they're in a sweet spot what i do see a lot of these independent watchmakers doing especially on the micro independent level again is they do a lot of consulting for other brands right so carrie butelain and will work with one of my favorite another independent brand, MBNF, and he'll do a movement for them. Rejep Rejepi will consult with certain brands and, and help them design and develop movements. So they, they sort of have to do other things in order to make their business grow. There are some independents that can be micro independents that sell watches under a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks. You know, how the, the manufacturing process is probably a little bit different, it's probably more outsourced manufacturing. Whereas I don't know a lot about the price points on some of these independents, but I can tell you, you know, you're realistically looking at a lot of times that twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar entry level. The best of the best, it's the market, I think, is correct in the pricing of those watches because you could put a, a Vacheron next to a Carrie Vutelain and and you can see that the level of quality is is there between both brands. The three brands that I chose to look out for Acrivia, Laurent Ferry, and Richard Mill, all have three, what I think are sort of different perspectives coming in to this year. Acrivia is so small. Uh, they are the epitome of what a, a independent is. And I think that's probably the most important thing. Like it is a watchmaker building a watch by hand. And then Laurent Ferrier, which is a little bit different, but they're, they're not necessarily manufacturing all their movements. 
but they are refinishing them to the finest standards available. Um, and they're they're building on like their foundation of a, a handful of watches and that collection, you're starting to see it blossom. I love how you can watch a an independent actually go from being uh, a watchmaker that has just a couple of watches coming out of the, their workshop to having 150 and then maybe growth to 200, whatever it might be down the line. And then RM, I love because they're such a marketing juggernaut and they're able to do these crazy things and sort of, they, they cross over to pop culture and things that a lot of brands find it very difficult to do. And I just think that the marketing side, as well as the products, because they, they create these incredible looking watches that look like these machines from the future that are sitting on people's wrists with bold colors and they're just super fascinating across the board. In 2019, they show you the way as an independent watchmaker that yeah, you can get there. Like you can you can follow this path, maybe not identically because they they have a very focused and very um, sort of dynamic product line that all fits within itself, but they're able to to show real growth and and really like collectors just clamor to it. They people want to own an RM. And I think that's really fascinating because that's not the case with every independent. If you have a lot of disposable income and you are interested in an independent brand, RM is probably a brand that you have heard of. If it's outside of those of the big guys, the Paddocks, the Rolexes, and the Audemars Piguet. Like that RM is sitting right there right in front of you. So the person who tends to go after a independent brand is to me somebody who has found themselves in their collecting habits, right? They, they've sort of understood where they wanna go. Most people know the big names, the Omegas, the Rolexes. So by the time you start getting to even a brand like Grand Seiko, which is technically a, it's a very large independent, but it is an independent and they're not extraordinarily expensive. Uh, once they start moving in that direction, I find with my own customers that they are really starting to carve out their niche, what they're really looking for. A lot of times accessibility becomes an issue, uh, but the person who decides that they want a Laurent Ferrier has probably at some point owned a paddock, they've owned a Breguet, they've owned another high-end brand, and they have found that Laurent Ferrier style is, matches more of their personality and what they're looking for. Interestingly, the independents are the ones that hold the value the best. I would not advise looking at an independent necessarily if you're if you're looking at it for the for the money. Because what's going to happen is you are probably one of a very small number of people who have the means to buy the watch to begin with, whatever that brand is. I would tell people, and I do tell my customers, that when you are looking at independence specifically, you need to sort of look at what fits your personality, what fits your style. Because it's you can have that Richard Mille, which is crazy, or a MBNF that literally looks like a fastback or like a rocket ship or something, or you can do something that's sleek and understated like a Laurent Ferrier. There's no, there's no right answer to, to tell a customer other than to sort of follow whatever your sensibilities are in the independency. But the money is going to be something that I think long term, if you hold the watches long term, you'll be, you'll be safe in them uh, over a course of a decade or something like that. I wouldn't recommend getting into independent to necessarily use it and then to try to get out of it in a, in a short amount of time because that's, you know, financially that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. I still see a lot of independents, they wanna stay that way. They wanna stay micro, they wanna stay small, and they wanna create value where they think there are opportunities where customers might feel like they've been left behind by some of the bigger bigger conglomerates. And I think that's actually a smart strategy moving forward because there's so much exposure, there's so much uh, more information out there, and there's more, so much more accessibility to get to these guys that I actually think that, that it could be a winning strategy for a lot of companies in 2019 and beyond. I love talking about independent watchmakers and independent watchmaking. So if you have any questions about it, you want to reach me, contact me, be sure to hit me up on my Instagram and I'll make sure I get a hold of you. We can talk about it. We can swap stories I'm here to help out. Hope you liked my video. If you did, comment, like, subscribe for more Watchbox Studios original content.